I've got none other than Simeon Burnett. So please give it up for Simeon. Woo now Simeon, he's a proper Cockney boy. He was born and raised not, not far from here, isn't it? Whereabouts were you, were you born? Uh, Newham. Newham. Not in hey. Bow. <laughs> yeah, our rivals. But, uh, but anyway, um, Simeon's told us a little bit in the last few months just about his, his upbringing, how he got saved, how he came to, to Christ and so on. So I just want to dig a little bit deeper into that and find out what was his experience of church life because it sounds like he was a bit of a church hopper. Yeah? <laughs> so, yeah, we've got to keep an eye out on this one. But um, actually, in terms of like we're looking at the bigger, wider church at the moment, God's bigger plan, we, we don't want to get stuck with blinkers in the way that we see church life as elders, kind of this is the way we do it. We want to have a very wide kind of view of it. So actually, it's really helpful to be able to just interview uh, Simeon briefly this morning and ask him for the, the kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of, what does he see about us that's good? Maybe some pointers that actually we need to improve on and stuff that he's seen in other churches as well. So I'm just going to let you fire away. Tell us about your experience of other churches that you've been to and stuff that you've learned there, Simeon. Yeah, cheers, Evans. In terms of the ugly, this is the first church I've come to where the elders wear like new era hats and stuff like that. Um, can't say I've seen that before. Uh, no, um, let uh, I grew up going to a Pentecostal church. Um, then in terms of my teenage years, I didn't go to church, um, but I was going to every church youth club in the borough. And then um, when I grew up and I came to Christ, I went to a Baptist church, uh, which was very quiet, very... But the opposite of this. Um, yeah, we didn't raise hands. Uh, that, that was very improper uh, in, amongst the Baptists. Um, so, so yeah, I've had, a, I've had like from Pentecostal church to Baptist church and everywhere in between. Um, so what, one of the first things I noticed here was the welcome that I received um, from, from every single one of you, really. And that's every time someone comes up here and talks about East End Church, that's actually the first thing they talk about. It's the welcome that they received. And in the church that I came to before this, um, it was very much seen as the leader's job to do that. There were specific people that did that, and that was the, the leaders. And everybody else just sat in there, it's not my job. But actually, that's not really the biblical picture of the church. We make up the church. Um, and we all, we all have that responsibility. And I felt that this church does that really well. Um, that's the, that was my first impression. Um, the, and the reason that me and Simone are coming here um, is because uh, you guys as leaders really uh, value the word of God. Um, and our elders, uh, this is the thing that really like, struck me, is that you, every Sunday, try and come up here and stay true to the word of God, faithfully preach the word of God, and you preach with a passion. This, ain't just a, this isn't just a theoretical thing that you study. This, this will change your life. Um, and so that is another thing that I have seen in this church that we do very well. That's really helpful. And just to add to that, actually, there's a big plug for what uh, V was saying earlier on in terms of, you know, we want a church, sleeves rolled up. If, if you're here three weeks, you're part of the furniture, you're one of us. So please do welcome people that come in through the doors and stuff like that. Get them to sit with you and stuff. And, and just also, the, we always need hands to the pump in every single area of church life, whether it's the welcome team, the setup team, the PA, the visuals, all of that. We need help. So please, if, please just... Grab us at the end and let us know you're available. We'd love to get you plugged into something else that's going on. So, yeah, carry on, mate. Was, uh, was there anything else that you noticed that maybe uh, we're not doing as a church that you've maybe seen in other churches that you think we could learn from that? Yeah, I, one thing that I've learned going to different churches is different churches express biblical truths through their cultural eyes, yeah? So a lot of things you see in different churches, it's just cultural uh, often times. So if we're seeking to be true to the word of God, uh, living by the spirit, that will look different depending on our cultural differences. Um, so I try not to get too bogged down. By, so, so there's some things that you guys do that are a bit culturally different to me as a culture. Uh, maybe the worship songs, are they sound a bit different. To, but I, I, so long as you're singing Christ, I, I'm all right. I, I, can, I can bend to that. I'm not really bothered. So cultural stuff, I'm flexible to. One thing that... I was just thinking about in terms of diversity. Um, the previous church that I went to, we had a lot of people in the congregation with special needs. Um, and it was such a vast variety. And I, I don't know if you've ever like, thought about that. Do we have many people here with special needs? 
um, because a lot of churches around the country don't. Um, it's, it's actually a common thing. And, and my church seemed to do that really well. And I, I, honestly, I can't tell you why, but one thing that I've learned through working with young people with different needs is that maybe our, um, we can tailor wor our worship in a way that is maybe a bit more inclusive. Um, so, like, if you, um, some, sometimes autism express, expresses itself in a certain way, that if there's loud music, uh, you can't be in that space. Um, it, it would drive you crazy. So, I, I don't know, like, we're thinking about stuff like that, if, that, if that's what God is doing. Um, but again, I'm just aware that God might be doing something different in every church, and if, that, if that's not an emphasis for us, I, mean, I don't know. I, I'm not prescribing anything, that's just one thing that I notice in terms of diversity. When we hear diversity, we think of two things. We think race and gender, um, but it's not. It's, it's so much more than that. Um, uh, so that, that, that's one thing I can think of. But honestly, just looking at the worship this morning, it's free. Uh, we're free to worship. Everybody feels they can contribute. And that is just something that I love about this church. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Simeon. Simeon. Give it up for Simeon. And I'm going to hand back over to Tom. Thank you, boys. That's great. Helpful. Helpful. Interesting. Provocative. Um, uh, we're, going to, um, we're going to carry on looking at our series, looking at uh, God's great, big, beautiful plan. And so can I invite a great, big, beautiful man to uh, come up and, uh, and preach? Mr. Mr. Dan Owen. Thanks, mate. You say the nicest things. Um, so, yeah, we're going to start with Jenny um, sharing today's scripture. So, over to Jenny. Hi, I'm Jennifer Foster. Some people call me Jenny. Some people call me Jen. I am just grateful to be called. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I attend East End Church. Um, I'm trying to think of something you guys don't know about me, but I've got a feeling many of you might know this about me. I can be a bit lastminute.com, like right now. I'm recording this at midnight, and I can imagine. <laughs> but yes, midnight I'm recording this. But um, one thing you guys don't know about me, when I was 14 years old, I decided that I was going to read the Bible from start to finish. It was a bit of an academic exercise. I thought this is something I could say, almost like a party trick I've read the Bible from start to finish so I started this when I was 14 years old um, but as these things happen and it wasn't planned well uh, in heaven it was I guess <laughs> I gave my life to Christ and when I gave my life to Christ I remember making a confession on a Sunday and then on the Monday I was beginning the New Testament Matthew so I would say that was divine perfect timing because it came at a time when I was ready to embrace this new faith and I needed to um, learn more about the Jesus I was following. <laughs> so uh, that came at a very interesting time. Uh, so that's me, I'm Jennifer Foster and I am a member of East End Church. Now today's scripture I'm reading from Jeremiah 29, 4 to 7. <clears throat> I begin. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens, eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So, yeah, today I'm talking about a passage of the Bible um, where the Israelites are in exile, they're away from their home in a foreign land. And it got me thinking, what is the thing that you miss when you are away from home? Um, not many people have had a chance to leave home in the last 12 months, 18 months. But when I go on holiday, I did manage to get away for a bit last year, um, you notice that I'm quite a lanky fella. And when, when I do go away, I'm always gutted to find that the duvet cover's not big enough for me. And I have to make a decision, am I going to have a cold chest or cold feet, which ruins the holiday for a bit. You've you got people speaking um, in a way you can't really understand, and the, and the food's different. Um, 
I mean, we were only in Scotland, but you do, you do miss home. Um, but just to, to paint that picture of, of this longing for home in all of us, pushing our technical team to the limits today, I've got another video, so uh, brace yourselves. These are the wishes of Marcus Aurelius. Free the prisoners, go! So that's the end of the film Gladiator, one of my favourite films. And he comes to the end of his life and um, he's defeated the evil emperor that, that killed his family and he dies and he goes home. He's going home. And why are so many films, do they portray this ending of this perfect home of being able to return there? I think it's because within each one of us is this longing for home, something greater. It came out in the worship this morning about Lisa's saying about this longing to, for heaven, somewhere better. And uh, it comes out in so many films. Next few films you watch, keep an eye out for it, this, this perfect image of home. A place where you feel safe, where you feel secure, where there's familiar people there, people that love you. Now, of course, some people get to experience that, but others do not. Other people... They have to leave their home. They're forced to leave and go to a foreign land. And this is called going into exile. And today we're looking at the particular time of where the Israelites go into, uh, are forced to leave their country and they're taken captive by Babylon and uh, forced to leave their homes. And I've got three points for you today. I've got the first one is the way of exile and how this world isn't our home. Second point is the way in exile how are we to live in a foreign land? And the third one is the way home, how Jesus has prepared a home for us. So this is part of um, the series that we're looking at of God's uh, big plan. And uh, once again, we go back to Genesis and we see that the whole story of the Bible is actually a story of a people in exile. God created a perfect home for us. The Garden of Eden. You know, you can't, you can't even begin to imagine just the beauty and the creativity. And Adam and Eve are there and they feel completely loved, completely accepted. They're there with God. And that was what home was meant to be. But actually through their own doing, through their own disobedience and sin, they have to leave this garden. They have to leave home. And, actually, and that's the start of this exile of mankind wandering around, not feeling at home anywhere. But today um, we're looking at um, the story of the, of the Israelites and hopefully if you feel lost here today, if you feel like you don't have a home, you feel like a bit of an outsider, you will see that actually this isn't home that God has prepared somewhere for you. So in 587 BC, 
the inhabitants of Jerusalem were taken captive. And when the Babylonians would come and um, take over a nation and conquer them, they wouldn't um, wipe them out, they wouldn't take them and put them in, in, in prisons. They took the people back to Babylon and they did this thing called assimilation where they would try and get them to lose their culture, lose their beliefs, um, lose all the things that make them the nation that they are and make them integrate and take on the ways of Babylon. And an example of this is, is Daniel in the Bible. He was one of the people that was taken captive during this time and he had his name changed to uh, Belteshazzar. Um, they, they made him educate in the ways of Babylon and uh, make him take on um, like the different, different sort of festivals and things like that and even gave him a good job in Babylon. They were trying to get him to lose sort of um, who he was as an Israelite. And Babylon would have been a really uncomfortable place for an Israelite to be. It would have been seen as very unholy, uh, very sinful, very anti-God. And it would have seemed like a really dark place. And actually, this is quite similar to probably how a lot of Christians feel in cities around the world. Babylon would have been similar to London. There would have been exiles there from all over the world. There would have been, you know, so much diversity um, that it probably wouldn't have looked too different to, um, to London. And actually, it's applicable to us because the Bible calls us, as followers of, of Jesus, exiles and foreigners. In 1 Peter um, 2, 11 and 12, it should be up on the screen yet, yeah, it says, Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So in the Bible, when it talks about Babylon, it talks about um, a specific city, but also there's kind of this biblical narrative of this world system that opposes God. And actually, you could say that there's... That that cities today are a bit like Babylon because there's this kind of world system in them that want to take our eyes from God and onto other things. And I don't need to list the things that, that are trying to take our eyes off God because you see it all around. People going after these things for what they might call home and to feel satisfied, but they don't satisfy. And Peter's reminding us that, that it's, that is the, the war that is waging against us to fight these desires and keep seeking God. This place isn't home. So how are we supposed to live in a foreign land? How, would a, how are the Israelites supposed to live in exile? How do we live in exile? Well, these, these um, verses that Jenny read are kind of pointers for how to do that. So I'm going to read them again. It's Jeremiah 29, 4-7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I have carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, these words would have shocked them. They really would have shocked them. They were probably expecting one of two instructions. They were, they were thinking maybe, okay, God wants us to sort of withdraw, hold back, we'll try and preserve um, our religion and our, and our ways and our customs, and we won't get involved in this pagan culture. And actually, that can be a bit of a tactic of many churches today. Try and withdraw so that we don't get contaminated. I, I've met someone once who went to a church that was invitation only. You could, you, if you haven't got an invite, you're not coming in, sorry. I had a mate who was, um, he was a good footballer and he became a Christian. And they said, now that you're a Christian, you're going to have to think about stopping playing football. It's like, what? Withdrawing people from, from the culture and the community around them. The second one, 
um, is a bit like Maximus. And we've got a, got a picture of our gladiator. They might have thought, yeah, we'll go in, we're in captivity, and uh, they'll think that we're kind of one of them, and then we'll strike and we'll take them down from the inside like Maximus did. The emperor wasn't expecting it, and he went and plunged a knife into him and get him from the inside. And then they hear that these instructions are coming from God. There's been a word from Jeremiah, guys, about how we're to live in, in captivity, and they're reading it, and they're like, what does it say? What does it say? It says we've got plant gardens. And we've got a plant, what? Plant gardens. And uh, this is a live stream of uh, mine and Ros's assault on Babylon in our estate in Hackney. There it is, doing its job, taking, taking the works of the enemy down. Um, so we, we had that put there because there was a, there was a real fly tipping problem. And, um, and that there, doesn't it look better? Occasionally you do get a mattress lying on top of those plants, which kind of, which is a little bit sad. But, uh, but these would have shocked them. You know, they went to school, these Israelites, learning about the evil Babylonians. And now God's telling them to have kids and send them to school in Babylon, a place where there's foreign gods, a place where they, you know, they, they talk differently, they've got different culture there. Um, they wouldn't have seen God's glorious diversity. They wouldn't have seen his creativity. They would have just seen a threat, an enemy, an oppressor. But God was showing them that he cares about everyone out there, no matter how sinful they are or how far from God, how different they were. Their mindset was, like, how do we get out of Babylon? How do we get out of here? God was saying, settle down and be a blessing. Engage with every part of your community. Start businesses. Work for the local authority. Work in schools. Join the sports team. Work in healthcare. I want you in all of these areas. And God wants his people today, his church, to have the same strategy. Um, Steve, one of our elders, gave me a book to read about this. And um, the, Steve's Kiwi, and the guy that wrote the book, Kiwi. And it's funny, because when I was reading the book, my inner monologue had a Kiwi accent. So I'm going to read this quote, but I'm going to try to uh, talk normally. They were, this is what it says about those verses, they were to overcome evil with good. They were to be good citizens in Babylon, not judges of Babylon. They were to be fruit bearers, not fruit inspectors. They were to see the glass as half full rather than half empty. They were there for the city. The city was not there for them. In other words, the answer to their prayers was themselves. There's a guy called Ed Delph. Not judges of Babylon, not fruit bearer, um, to be fruit bearers, not fruit inspectors. How long has the church been seen for what it's against? For being, for being judge, judgmental to those around us? Um, you make it hard for someone to feel judged when you're laying your life down for them, when you're serving them, when you're praying for them. Jesus said, he said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Love those verses. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in like a really, really dark place and um, you've, you've turned a torch on, or, or even if it's been really dark, you just light a match and that little match just kind of lights the room up so much more. If, if I lit a match now, you'd probably barely see the light because it's quite light in here. Well, I, I was um, invited to go and do a kid's talk at a church back home and I thought, oh, I've got a great idea for a talk. I thought, you know, Charlie would be proud of me for this one. And, and I thought, I'm going to go back there and uh, I'm going to get, get a kids in a dark room and I'm going to light this match and they'll see how light it is. Anyway, I get all the kids uh, in this room and like taped up all the corners and shut the door and it's like pitch black. 
And then, um, then I could hear a kid crying. <laughs> and then um, I thought, I can't find the light switch. So, so I, I lit this match, and the match just lit the whole place up, and I could just see all of these terrified faces. And uh, I realised that it wasn't such a good idea, because um, effectively what I'd done is I'd ushered 10 kids that didn't know me into a, into a pitch black room, shut the door, and then start a fire. And um, so if you've got kids in a kids club, you know I do it on the rotor, I have no say over the content, all right? Don't, don't, please don't worry about that. But that little match, you know, it lit the whole room up. And I love what um, Pauline came and shared about being diamonds, you know. You might feel like you've got a bit of a dusty coat on you, but when the light shines on you, you sparkle. You send rays of light going off into all different areas. And like with a diamond, you know, the light doesn't come from it, it's just reflecting it. And that's what we're to be like. When we're in communities, if there's like diamonds dotted around in all of these places, when Jesus shines his light on us, it's going to bring a light to those places. Because, you know, being a light, it's not about being a goody two-shoes. It's not about being this nice Christian. Oh, they're so nice. It's not, it's just about being sold out for Jesus and to being so thankful for what he's done in your life and just imitating and, and being obedient to the things that he wants you to do. And when you're in these different places and, and you let Jesus into your life, life more, you shine brighter. And, it, and the ways that people notice, it's things like the way you handle your money. Oh, look, they handle their money different, they're quite generous. Or the way you treat your partner, your, your husband or your wife. The way you raise your kids. Have kids in Babylon. And I, like, I loved what uh, Sim was saying about diversity. Actually, God's saying that young and old can have a, an impact in Babylon. I want your children to be a part of this plan. Um, the way you use your time. All of these different things. And one of the people that was carried to, who I've already mentioned, Daniel, he was brilliant at serving Babylon. He, he, he kind of climbed the ranks and they could see this guy's got real, you know, he's an amazing man. And he served his heart out for that city. But the book of Daniel really kind of focuses on points in his life when he says, I'm not stepping over this line. And that was when it would have been compromising his faith. And I think that, that shines brightly as well. And he was willing to go to the lion's den for the things that he wouldn't compromise on. Um, and I just want to share a little testimony, actually, about how these verses have impacted mine and Ros's life. And I, I hope it doesn't sound like sort of bigging ourselves up, because I know that you know there's tons of people here that would have done a better job, but... When we were thinking about, uh, well, soon after we got married, we were thinking, okay, God, what's the next stage for us? Do you want us to stay in London um, or do you want us to move on somewhere else? And we'd, we were thinking, do we rent a place so we can be flexible or, God, do you want us to put down roots in Hackney? And um, we'd seen this house um, on this estate and just God had kind of really put it on our heart. And um, we were praying about it this one particular afternoon and then that evening, we went to um, a conference, and the guy was speaking on this ver these very verses. We were saying, God, do you want us to stay here? And the guy was preaching on, settle down, build houses, have children. And we were like, okay, that's pretty clear, God. <laughs> Why can't all answers to prayer be that clear? So um, we moved in, and then um, soon after, we realized that it was quite a hostile estate. Is actually the estate that Carl Bodecker grew up on, if that paints a little bit of a picture for you. And it's not as rough as it was when he was a kid. Um, but, you know, the, the pub on the edge of the estate, it didn't have, like, it wasn't, like, all nice and gentrified. It didn't have your quirky sort of hipster quote on, the, on a board out the front. It had a half-torn piece of A4 paper that said, if you're coming to watch the football, you better buy a drink. It's like, what sort of welcome message was that? If it had a quiz machine, one of the questions would have been, what are you looking at? It, it was that sort of area. And we'd been there a little while, and um, only a few months, and then one day Ros witnessed an attempted murder right outside our house. And we're like, oh, what? And um, 
Suddenly, our home didn't really feel like a home. We felt really unsafe. We felt, you know, because Roz was, she was having to go to court for it. And we thought, we're like, we felt really, uh, you know, threatened. And had it not been for these verses, I think we would probably just moved somewhere else. We felt like, no, God has clearly said, settle down here and pray for the peace and prosperity of this area. So I tell you what, when you kind of feel a bit scared in your own home, that really gets you praying. Um, so we were praying for our estate and um, one of our friends from a church at the time, blessing Kenrick, he came, we walked around the estate and one day like Kenrick gets this olive oil and starts pouring it on the floor. I'm like, Kenrick, what are you doing? He's like, I'm anointing your estate, which I don't even know if that's a thing. So don't take my words on it. Um, but we've been praying for that estate, like, God, will you bring peace on this estate? Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come. And um, what other things have we been doing? Okay, so you can see we planted a garden, a few little gardens. They don't look particularly great. Um, we've had kids while we've been there. And it's not like we were following this like, plan, but we look back and actually see like, the, the ways that God's used those moments. Like, our kids are out, they're around our, our, our Muslim neighbours' houses. Um, they're being part of this sort of redemptive plan for our community. And I love what Des shared about the fact that, you know, it's not about doing amazing things. It's not this, you know, military procedure where you're going around doing these in, in armour. It's just, it's mundane. I mean, being part of our tenants' association is the most boring thing in the world. These meetings, but we're getting to meet people. Um, you know, had kids, you know, and, and just through these little things, God's actually start, we're starting to see change. And you know, since that day of, of that attempted murder, I can't recall one violent attack on our estate. You know, God is changing it for the better. He's, he's bringing, he is bringing his kingdom. So the way home. The Israelites held on to this hope while they were in captivity that one day a rescuer was coming, that God would send someone. Generations later, Jesus turns up and there's another oppressive regime, the Romans. And he doesn't come with violence or force to overthrow them. He wanders around like an exile. He doesn't have a home. He he announced to people that, yes, you are lost. Yes, this longing that you have inside of you for a home, it is real and there is a home that I want to take you to. And he says, the way to get there is me. I am the way. Jesus really cared about people who didn't have homes. He welcomed the stranger. He said, Things like love is shown when you invite an outcast into your home. Jesus left the perfect home, the, the place that we look forward to. He lived a perfect life. He lived as an exile. And he died on the cross for you and for me to make a way for us to come home. He didn't, we didn't assist him um, getting there. We don't follow home close, follow closely behind him to heaven. We are totally dependent on him making a way, dying for all the things that have separated us from this home, dying for us so that we can have a hope to go back to him. And on the on the the day the night before he was crucified, he said, "Guys, I'm going to prepare a place." And he's like, "My father's house." has got many rooms, there's space for you. And, and he, he's got this promise of a home for each one of us. And, and I, uh, I don't know exactly what heaven's gonna be like. I loved what Tom shared about this place where we can just worship God. Um, at Christmas time, uh, my la my, an old pastor of mine passed away and I was just thinking, what's it gonna be like? As, as this lovely guy, Les, he kind of comes into heaven. I just had this imagination of, of Jesus coming up and giving him a hug and said, giving him, putting his arm around and saying, Les, I'm so proud of you. You did, you did so well. And like puts his arm around and he takes him in and he's showing like, this is your home now. God's got a place for us. And until Jesus returns for us, 
or we die and go to be him. We've got the Holy Spirit as like a deposit, as an assurance that we get to go there one day. And until then, what do we do as followers of Jesus? We, we live as citizens of heaven, as signposts to people on earth that there's something better to look for. So I just want to close, I just want to close with a, a prayer there, guys. Lord, Lord, I just lift up people here this morning that do feel lonely, that feel like an outsider, Lord, whether we've got people here that are actually exiles in this world who have left their home country, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would give them peace. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to feel loved and welcomed in this community, God. And uh, Jesus, I just thank you so much that you left your home in heaven to come down and make a way for us. You didn't take an easy route, God. You were tortured and killed for our sins, Father. And I'm just so thankful that one day we will get to come to be with you in heaven. Amen.